I prepared an incomplete uh, program for next year. There are a number of invitations and messages that are flying through cyberspace right now, and by May we should have finished filling this in. It's just because people are jockeying for position, you understand, and you can't really tell who's going to have what. They're putting in their bits. Um, I actually claim Canto 6 because I enjoy talking about the political aspects of the Commedia. And I know that Brian O'Connor, who's off making more copy copies of the poem, will be speaking. Todd Bolai, who has spoken before, will read a canto, I believe. And, um, oh, maybe there are three, three or four other people who, whom we've um, spoken to about the last slot or the last two slots. I'm not quite sure how it will work out. And we have visitors from the Midwest, from uh, Rutgers. It should be an interesting year next year. I'm looking forward to it. It will also be slightly more demanding on you than uh, previous years because we've added one reading. Uh, in the past, in the past, we um, tried to put two readings, two pantheon together. But I, I, I think that's cheating. I never find it quite as satisfying as when we have the time to discuss one canto at length and not feel pressed to, um, to skip something. And, um, and so we simply added an extra reading. We'll see how that goes. I, I was always worried that there'll be a snowstorm in January, but that hasn't slowed us down in the past, so we will go ahead um, with this new schedule. Let's see, David, should we introduce you or should we wait till Brian gets back? Uh, well, I don't. I don't want to start if Brian's going to be sauntering in, and if there's some other people okay, I need. We're going to wait another few. I mean, oh, why, why don't we? I want well, we just. I mean, it's okay. fine. Well. Um, <laughs> it's always a special pleasure to uh, when when I am able to introduce graduate students as the readers because they bring uh, rigor and I think uh, a freshness um, to their reading that that all of us need to remember, that we can never afford to lose. Uh, our reader tonight, David Saluski, is a young man who in his first semester as a graduate student at Boston College, now unfortunately he's in his fourth semester and ready to move on, um, showed himself to be a, a highly intelligent and ardent seeker of meaning. And that is why I asked him to read this canto tonight and that is why I introduce you to him with, with special anticipation, special pleasure. So, Thanks. David. And if you'd like, we can wait uh, until we get those. Uh, you can entertain us and I'll wait for When Professor Shepard says that grad students bring fresh perspective, it just underlines the fact that I don't have a PhD, I'm not a Dante scholar, and so I hope to be very provocative and um, I can certainly talk a lot louder. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, they gave me a microphone. This is dangerous that BC gave me a microphone. I might talk about my political views or something, but I'll stick to Dante. Um, but I do, I do hope, it is certainly a challenge to try and bring a fresh perspective. I, I do try to, uh, I hope tonight to be able to kind of push the text and maybe try and take it in some directions that um, I can see it can be entirely wrong. And so I actually hope it will uh, bring up a level of discussion because I know Actually, a lot of my students are here tonight, and I know they've been reading Dante, so I'm excited to maybe see if they already have, because they're also fresher than I am, actually, because um, I've read it a few times, but, but now i got students with me here who, uh, it's their first time. Okay, can we turn the volume up? Sure. I also got a television down here. I don't know, so maybe it's not even in. Maybe it's not even in. Let's try that first. She did say to enter entertain you, so. <laughs> How many grad students does it take to turn a microphone? All right. Um, <laughs> technician guy. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now in the front? Excellent. Good. I will make a... All right. Excellent. Okay. Well, let's begin. 
We're at Canto 4 in Purgatory. In last month's exciting installment, our wayfarers, Dante and Virgil, were grossly engaged in a conversation with uh, Malfredi, who was the illegitimate son of Frederick II, who died on the battlefields of Benevento in 1266. He was cleaved here and then the forehead and received another fatal blow. And in the last moments before dying, he finally consigned his soul to God and in that last moment received grace. These are the kind of people that make me think I should live a life of rock and roll and just you know, convert at the last second. Um, he's that kind of character. These were the souls of the excommunicates, people who were pushed out of the church, but by the grace of God were then allowed to enter into purgatory, which is a place of purgation. These souls will, through a set number of years, undergo penitence and then will then be numbered among the saints in heaven. But tonight, um, this canto, I think, invites us to change the tempo a bit of this poetry because there's a lot of haste in, in Dante's journey. He's in purgatory. He's met an old friend named Casella, a singer. He's then met Manfredi, Malfredi, sorry, um, this, uh, this soldier, this warrior who converts at the last minute. But we're now entering into a canto in which we're going to meet with another group of souls who are lazy. These are negligent souls. And I think that's sort of a tone that Dante is asking us to read this in a bit. If you can look, please, if you have a copy of the handout that I gave you. I wanted to start with the image, because Dante is all about imagery. You have this image of the souls, and we're going to be meeting one soul in particular, and, I, and you can probably guess who that is. He's the one who's completely slouched over. I mean, he's lazier than all the other ones, hiding. I'm basically uh, resting here in the shadow of this massive boulder with his head between his legs and his hands around his knees. If you look down, I, I wanted to start, again, by setting the tone of, when I, when I say lazy, I'm not talking about a characteristic, you know, someone's lazy, everyone's lazy, um, but we're talking about negligence, and I wanted to, uh, because Dante is someone who is a scholar, he's well-versed in theology and philosophy, he's someone who's very intimate with St. Thomas Aquinas, I wanted to pull some quotations from Thomas Aquinas and look at those together, from St. Thomas Aquinas' uh, Summa Theologica, the uh, secunda secundae partis, so question 54, it begins, I answer that negligence denotes lack of due solicitude. solicitude. For negligence is opposed to diligence, and diligence is that which is required of every virtue. We're looking at souls who lack that zeal, that Christian zeal to love God. Negligence is a defect, I continue to read, in the internal act to which choice also belongs, while idleness and laziness denote slowness of execution, yet so that idleness denotes slowness in setting about the execution, while laziness denotes remissness of the execution itself. This is not just people who say, um, I'll do it tomorrow and don't do it. These are people who, within their soul, are indecisive. They can't even internally come to any particular decision. Um, hence, it, become, it is becoming that laziness should arise from sloth, which is an oppressive sorrow. And finally, man may be said to love God less in two ways. The question of negligence is critical for the understanding of the Christian soul as one that is asked to love God. And the first way that the soul can love God less is through a lack of fervor of charity. Again, negligence, this lack of that Christian zeal, the fervor for charity. Charity is not the 10% you're doing it every year. Charity is caritas, love for, the, for God and for your neighbor, and so on and so forth. These are the kind of souls that upon hearing the opening of St. Augustine's Confessions that, God, I will not rest until I rest in you, wouldn't even bat an eyelid. And that's what I want to start with tonight. We're going to meet a group of souls, and out of this uh, crowd of souls will emerge to encounter Dante. Is going to be a soul who is lazy, but also very sharp of wit. He's going to, we're going to see a rather sarcastic exchange and I want to analyze the structure of this poetry and the narrative technique of this episode that has rendered Belacqua, which is the name of the soul we're going to encounter, justly famous. But I, what I want, to, I want to hint at right away, which will carry us hopefully through the entire uh, lecture, is that the encounter of the soul of Belacqua is not just one who is negligent, but is actually going to manifest a very important tension that is very revealing of Dante's psychology. Dante's psychology as the poet writing the poem, and also as Dante the pilgrim who is going through this pilgrimage. And there's also a tension that's very critical for the entire work of the Commedia, and that's going to be the tension between the sense of negligence 
and also this diligence, the solicitude, the tension between zeal, which Dante is certainly a character that embodies, he's very zealous, and also the sin, on the other hand, of, of negligence and laziness. So why not start with the poem? Brian, can I get a photocopy of the content? Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Has everyone got a copy? Excellent. If you don't, ask Brian. He'll uh, pass it out. <laughs> Brian, don't sit down. Don't be lazy. All right, let's read, let's, let's read the content together. When any of our faculties retains a strong impression of delight or pain, the soul will wholly concentrate on that, neglecting any other power it has. And this refutes the error that maintains that one above the other several souls can flame in us. And thus, when something seen or heard secures the soul in stringent grip, time moves and yet we do not notice it. The power that perceives the course of time is not the power that captures all the mind. The former has no force, the latter binds. And I confirm this by experience, hearing that spirit in my wonderment, for though the sun had fully climbed 50 degrees, I had not noticed it. The last encounter Dante had was with Malfredi, an encounter which, um, by the time Dante's aware, uh, it, it took almost two hours, actually. Dante arrives on the shores of purgatory after going through hell, right at sunrise. Dante meets some souls, he meets Malfredi, and at a certain point, he looks up and he realizes, oh my goodness, about three hours, the sun has raised 50 degrees. What Dante is trying to do here with this rather philosophical discourse, um, which is by no means a, a pause from his poetry, he's trying to reflect on the nature of the human soul. He's also trying to excuse himself for being distracted. What Dante is talking about when he talks about the power or faculties of the soul in these opening four tercets, uh, he refers to potenza or virtu, powers or virtue. He's referring to the faculties of the soul. And when he says that he's talking about this, he's also refuting the error that maintains that one above the other, several souls can flame in us. This is line six and seven. Dante is trying to refute a philosophical error, a mistake, which is that of Plato, which believed that the human soul was actually made of various different souls. What this would imply is that if the soul were made of various different souls that were independent, that were separate, then when the soul, when the human individual is engaged in an activity, in this case having a conversation, the faculty of the soul, or the soul that's sort of in charge of recognizing that time is passing by, would not be distracted. But Dante, who's calling on the authoritative company of Aristotle, Aquinas, Avros, Albertus Magnus, and all others, he's trying to defend the unity of the human soul. The way that Dante's trying to understand this for us is that the soul has various powers that are subjugated. You have the vegetative soul, and this might be banal for people who've done philosophy 101 or something, but you have a vegetative soul, which is a life force. And upon that, you then have a sensitive soul. And then upon that, you have a, the sensitive soul basically is a soul um, for the senses that um, that you're able to the organs, through nose and eyes, you can see, you can hear, you can engage the world. And in engaging the world, you then have the intellective power, reason. And what Dante's trying to say is that, in, uh, let me just go back for a second, I'm sorry, that when Dante presents these three faculties, um, he, he, he presents them as vivere, sentire, and ragionare, to, to live, to sense, and to reason. And if these powers are not subordinate to one soul, but were separate, autonomous, and fully independent, each with its own presence in the human individual, then while the soul was bent on an activity that engaged the mind, the individual would still be free enough to notice something else, in that case, the passage of time. So Dante, in his philosophical discourse, he's, he's engaging in a progress that occurs often in the, in the Commedia, is that he's having an experience, a poetic experience. He's encountering souls. He encounters Casella, and if you look at number two, I wanted to point you out to a, a quotation. He's encountered a soul, a friend of his who sang, uh, who known for singing you know, songs and music. And what occurs here, and I'll read, my master, Virgil, and I, and all that company around the singer seemed so satisfied as if no other thing might touch our minds. We all were motionless and fixed upon the notes when all at once the gray old man cried out, what have we here, you laggard spirits? This is Cato, 
speaking. What negligence, what lingering is this? Quick to the mountain to cast off the sloth that will not let you see God show himself. Dante will walk away from this, Virgil will walk away from this encounter. They disperse like pigeons pecking at, at bread, right? Why, why, uh, why uh, concern yourself with crumbs when you have the banquet of God waiting for you? And they disperse. And Virgil is stung by the fact that he too got caught up. They were engaged. The, the, the sentire, the part of the, the faculty of the soul engaged in, in, in hearing was fully engaged in the music that they lost track of time and they lost track of the larger scope of this, of this uh, journey. And then again, Manfredi, as I've already talked about. So Dante's doing it after these experiences, he's starting to slow down, he's starting to reflect doctrinally, philosophically, theologically on the nature of the soul and how we tend to get distracted, especially on our spiritual path. We are set on loving God and we get distracted. Dante's commenting this for himself, hopefully assuring us that this won't happen again, but of course it will. And also commenting just on the soul in general. Dante, in, he's been in hell, he's now in purgatory. He's going to start concerning himself with the soul because the soul is what will be recovered. It will be purged to become then perfect and then to ascend through the celestial bodies up into heaven. So this is a very opportune thing that Dante is doing now at the beginning of this canto. Let's move on, right? We're going to be too distracted, was Dante is trying to tell us here in this opening first lines. Let's read on with the ascent, which then occurs. Even this, in, this interior um, philosophical reflection Dante is going on is, is interrupted also um, by what? The fact is that in, in the previous counties, you remember Dante and Virgil were looking for the path to go up the mountain. They're still on the shores. They need to ascend. And they ask these souls, the souls that are in the company of, of Malfredi, and in this reflection that Dante is going, uh, is, is going on in his mind here, it's, it's finally interrupted by, in line 18, when the souls cry out, Qui è vostro dimando? Here is what you're looking for. Here is the answer. The answer is here is the path where ascension will now be possible. This four, uh, this four tercet opening is now concluded and we have another very active action about to take place. Immediately after Qui è vostro dimando? Here is your answer. Here's what you want. Dante opens with a pseudo simile. The farmer, this is line 19, the farmer, when the grape is darkening, will often stuff a wider opening with just a little fork full of his thorns. Then was the gap through which my guide and I, who followed after, climbed, we two alone, after that company of souls had gone. A pseudo simile it is because we don't have the grammatical structures of, of, um, just as or so, come, così in Italian, but is a very direct um, analogy, a direct um, image that is being evoked. He's not saying just like, but he's saying directly. Um, the farmer when the grape is dark, not just like the farmer, but the farmer when the grape is darkening. What is this imagery that's being evoked? This imagery brings us back to the countryside. It's a very agrarian, humble sort of imagery that Dante uses throughout his Commedia. When the grapes mature, turning juicy and ripe, just at the point to attract the desires of the vagabonds who may come along to pluck them away, the wise and cautious farmer with precision will take a small pitchfork full of thorns to fill the gaps in the vineyard. Dante's trying to say is that the path that they had to go on was much narrower than this. The comparison of the narrow path of ascent and the ascetic's purgation on the way to salvation is a derivation of a well-known um, verse from sacred scripture chapter 7 14 from the gospel according to matthew because straight is the gate and narrow is the way and which leads to life and there are few who who find it uh, i also would like to add that I, I think the scripture underlining this too is that famous episode of the rich man who wants to follow jesus but will not give up his riches he goes home sad and jesus turns around and says truly i say to you that it is easier for a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter heaven um, what Dante is saying here is that the path that Virgil and uh, Dante have to go through is so narrow that there will be no room for negligence. There will be ro no room for old habits and sin. We then move along. Line 25. San Leo can be climbed, one can descend to Noli and ascend Kakume and Bismantova with feet alone, but here I had to fly. I mean with rapid wings and pinions of immense desire behind the guide who gave me hope and was my light. We made our upward way through rifted rock along each side, the edges pressed on us, etc., etc. The next pseudo simile is that Dante's evoking these mountains, these paths which ascend to citadels or to other 
um, you know, peaks in, in Italy. Again, to try and just underline that those places are doable on feet, but here you need to fly, again, underlining the spiritual quality of this ascent. We're not just climbing up a physical mountain. This is an ascent for the soul, an ascent in which it's going to be very heavy at first because of the burden of our sin, but through ascent, hopefully, it will get lighter. As we continue to read, along each, we made our way up through rifted rock along each side. The edges pressed on us. When we had, line 34, when we had reached the upper rim of that steep bank emerging on the open slope, I said, my master, which well shall we take? And he to me, don't squander any steps, keep climbing up the mountain after me until we find some expert company. The summit was so high, my sight felt short. The slope was far more steep than the line drawn from middle quadrant to the center point. I was exhausted when I made this plea. O oh, gentle father, turn around and see. I will be left alone unless you halt. The Italian, um, which you know, I'll read at the end, of course, the, the sounds are harsh S sounds that really underline the tension and the ascent, and the difficulty of the ascent. Yes, salavamo, sassorotto, stringeo, strimo, suo di sotto. Um, basically, we went up, the broken rock, the, the extreme size closing in on us are all of these harsh S sounding words. Dante is overcome now by the slope's steep incline. If he was zealous at first, he's now fatigued. He yells out, he's lasso, he's exhausted. He yells out, oh, gentle father, turn around. Virgil, who, who often in Inferno will, will usually go Dante on, don't slow down, we have to keep on going, says that at first. But Dante again says, as he realizes that the, the climb of the ascent on um, this imagery of, how's it translated, of the uh, uh, a slope that was far more steep than the line drawn from middle quadrant to center point. If there's any people who know ge uh, geography really, or uh, geometry really well, they realize that that's steeper than a 45 degree angle. Dante finally accommodates, uh, I'm sorry, Virgil finally da uh, accommodates Dante and, and points to a, a slope for them to rest. It's at this point then, again, that an action concludes and we have another, another discussion. Um, let's see here. Again, from line 46, my son, he said, draw yourself up to here while pointing to a somewhat higher terrace, which circles all along the slope on either side. His words incited me, my body tried, one hand, on hands and knees I scrambled after him until the terrace lay beneath my feet. There we sat down together facing east. Dante, even though he's talking about a, a moral ascent, he never ignores the logical succession of climbing mountains. It's really hard climbing mountains. And there's a moment where you start to lose your way, you start to be full of apprehension. And now they're taking a rest. But even in this moment of rest begins another very interesting conversation between the, between the poet and between the guide, Virgil. Once they get to the top, and I read line 52, there we sat down together facing east in the direction from which we had come. What joy to look back at the path we've climbed, which is very normal. Every, who, who here has climbed a mountain and doesn't look back and say, wee, look how far we've come, right? But again, uh, is it appropriate to look back when we're heading up towards God? My eyes were set on the shores below, and then I raised them toward the sun, and I was amazed to find it fall on our left. Now, that's something that's very strange. And what begins is a very interesting dialogue on cosmological and geographical matters. What Dante is amazed to see is that the sun is not falling on his right, as it should, because he's from Italy, the northern hemisphere, but is actually falling on his left. Um, it's a rather long dialogue that ensues, and I don't want to focus too much on this, but hopefully I can clear myself with a, a, di a, 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 a diagram here. This is not a hypnotic device to keep in your seats, but it's the world. Dante's trying to show you, here's the world. Let's say this is east, so we have the equator, right? And then you have the, what's it called, Trap Tropic of Cancer, right? And then Capricorn. If this is east, then we have Jerusalem right here, Mount Zion. What Dante's trying to do is he's trying to geographically locate purgatory. Where is purgatory? It's antipodal. It's on the opposite side of the, of the earth from Jerusalem. Here's Mount Zion. I'm sorry, that's Zion. Here's purgatory. What Dante's trying to express is in this very personal moment where he realizes, my goodness, the sun's on the other side, he's trying to show us that the sun were here, and it follows the path of the equator, then someone standing in the northern hemisphere would feel that, would notice that the sun is shining on their right, when if they were here, they would notice it's actually shining on their left. Does that make sense? 
If it doesn't, don't worry about it. It's okay. <laughs> it's So Virgil is like, okay, I have to explain this to Dante because he can tell that Dante is like, wait a minute, the sun. The sun which has been accompanying Dante from the very, very beginning. Um, the sun which in Canto 1 was vanquishing the dark last hour, the, the dark's last hours in Encanto um, 2 which from all sides shot forth the day and then Encanto 3 was flaming red is now Encanto 4 on Dante's right. He's becoming aware of this. So it, let's, let's read on. Line 61. Virgil says to Dante, suppose Castor and Pollux were in conjunction with that mirror here, that's referring to the Gemini, and that's on the sign under which Dante was born, I found out, which takes the light and guides it north and south, then you would see the reddish zodiac still closer to the bears as it revolves, unless it has abandoned its old track. It would, if, uh, if you would realize how that should be, then concentrate imagining this mountain so placed upon the earth that both Mount Zion and it, although in different hemispheres, share one horizon before you can see putting your mind to it attentively. How that same path which Phaeton drove so poorly must pass this mountain on the north, whereas it skirts from Mount Zion on the southern side. Dante responds, and here's a moment in which Dante, you have an image of Virgil and Dante, sort of like two faculty professors with a sense of camaraderie discussing matters of which they're both equals. Dante is very much, enjoys the fact that he gets it, he understands, he sees the heavens, and he understands perfectly well how um, this mountain, this mountain of purgatory, is geographically located. My master, surely I have never, since my intelligence seemed lacking, seen as clearly as I now can comprehend that the mid-circle of the heaven's motion, one of the sciences calls it um, equator, which always lies between the sun and winter, as you explained, lies as far north of here as it lies southward of the site from which the Hebrews looking toward the tropics saw it. But having that sort of, uh, that curiosity say, um, satisfied for Dante, he now has another question. But he says, but if you please, but if it please you, I should willingly learn just how far it is we still must journey, right? He knows where we are, but he, now he looks up to the mountain. He says, the slope climbs higher than my eyes can follow. He can follow the course of the stars, but when he looks up the ascent that awaits him, a moral ascent, he can only see so far. And he's concerned. In some ways, it's a question, um, I was talking to Mr. Shepard about this, it's a question that this doesn't make any sense. If you're on this pilgrimage towards God, you're going to make it. If not, well, that's just a big problem. So it's a question that really doesn't make a lot of sense. If asking this, like, well, how much further do we have to go? Of course you have a lot more to go. And how does Virgil respond to this? He says in line 88, this mountain's of such, of such a sort that climbing it is hardest at the start but as we rise, the slope grows less unkind. Therefore, when the slope seems to you so gentle that climbing farther up will be as restful as traveling downstream by boat, you will be there, this, you, will, you will be where this pathway ends, and there you can expect to, be, to put your weariness to rest. I say no more, and this I know is truth. Again, if we understand this ascent as something moral, as Dante is ascending up the mountain, washing away this, his sins one by one, by the time he gets to the top, it will certainly be an easier journey. And in some ways, Dante, I'm imagining, is thinking about these, like, ah, yes, I can't wait to get to the top. And as he's thinking this, I'm guessing, in line 97, and when his words were done, another voice nearby was heard to say, well, perhaps you will have need to sit before you reach that point. Hearing that voice, both of us turned around, and to the left we saw a massive boulder which neither he nor I before had noticed. We made our way toward it and toward the people who lounged behind that boulder in the shade as men beset by listlessness will rest. So here again, Dante's being interrupted. And what is this voice that we hear? <coughs> this voice that we hear is, as I said in Italian, una voce di presso. It's a voice close by. And when they hear this, they turn around, they see a crowd of souls lying about in the shade of a massive boulder. At first, they weren't aware of them because they had been directing their attention upward to the heavens. Dante employs a technique that's rather, um, by now, uh, kind of typical. He first notices a crowd of souls, but then he focuses in on one in particular. Um, what we have in the Italian, when Dante notices these souls um, that are, seem exhausted, that seem listless, that are languid, that are lazy, it begins a word, he, he starts with the word negligence on line 105, which is indolence. It begins a steady stream of words expressing laziness, lasso, weary on 106. 
which is the same word that Dante described for himself when he was getting tired going up the mountain. He says, I was last, so I was exhausted when I said, oh, Father, when will we stop? And then we have negligente, negligent, pigrizia, laziness on, one, on 111. Dante Pilgrim, although exhausted after having pleaded to Virgil to stop and take a rest, is quick to point out now to his guide the same deficiencies in these other souls. Dante has gone through hell. He knows what sin looks like. He knows what the exterior manifestations of these sins are. He's, these are souls he can tell right away. He doesn't need to speak with them. He doesn't need to engage them to find out who they are. And what Dante then does, he then focuses in on one particular soul. As you, you can imagine, like, again, that's why I gave you this, this picture. You have a bunch of souls, but there's one of them that just really captures his attention. Line 106. And one of them who seemed to me exhausted was sitting with his arms around his knees. Between his knees, he kept his head bent down. And Dante says, oh, my sweet Lord, I said, look carefully at one who shows himself more languid than he would have been were laziness his sister. I mean, how do you come back to that? That's a pretty, it's a pretty harsh thing for Dante to say. As we read ahead, then the shade turned toward us attentively, lifting his face, but just along his thigh, and said, climb then, if you're so vigorous. Then I knew who he was, and the distress that still was quickening in my heart, my breath somewhat, did not prevent me by going to him. Dante, as he hears this, goes closer. And he says, when I had reached him, scarcely lifting up his head, he said, again, another, I mean, I hope you guys can sense there's a very strong sense of irony and sarcasm in what's being read here. And he says again to him, line 119, and have you fathomed how the sun can drive his chariot on your left? The slowness of his moments his brief words had stirred my lips a little toward a smile. Here's one of those really great moments where Dante smiles, which are very rare. And then I began, from this time on, bell'acqua. This is a moment in poetry called Inizione, in which the identity of, a, of an individual is finally revealed. So who is this bell'acqua? Who is this lazy soul that Dante seems to encounter on his way up the mountain? I'm just looking for something here. Hold on. Bellacqua. We have to ask the question who this is. We find out that Bellacqua was a Florentine. He was a contemporary of, of Dante. Um, said by early commentaries to have been a musical instrument maker. And modern research identifies him with Duccio di Bonavia. According to one commentator, De Benedetti, Bellacqua passed away sometime before March 1302, but was still most likely alive in 1299. So this is someone that Dante knew. He was a contemporary. He was a, a personal friend. And so he is indeed perhaps one of the most recent souls that Dante encounters on his journey. I mean, again, if you think about the psychology of Dante's writing this poem and a friend of his recently passes away and he puts him in his poem, uh, it really indicates there's a very special importance to this encounter that we're about to read. Uh, read. Um, we can assess that Bellacqua is a new arrival, as I said. And besides being a maker of musical instruments, he was something of a musician, and Dante, who, as a lover of music, was very intimate with Bellacqua on this very account. Historically, however, Bellacqua was also noted for his indolence. He was absolutely lazy. And uh, a famous commentary in the early 1400s uh, says the following about Bellacqua. Bellacqua was a citizen of Florence, an artisan of musical instruments, who made lutes and guitars, and was the laziest man who ever lived. It is said of him that he would arrive to a shop in the morning, promptly plop himself down, and pass the entire day lying about only to get up when moved by the compulsion to either eat or sleep. Now, Dante frequently reproached Bellacqua for his laziness, and we have a very humorous and yet touching moment between these two in, uh, on the streets of Florence. I can imagine one day Bellacqua sitting in the shade of the streets of Florence, just as he's in the shade on the slopes of, of Purgatory. And he looks up and he sees Dante, Dante with his crooked nose and probably his glaring eyes, and he's looking at Bellacqua. And even before Dante can pronounce some sort of reproach, Bellacqua steps in and he quotes Aristotle, Book of Physics, Chapter 7. He says, Dante, the soul becomes wise when one is seated and quiet. 
Dante supposedly did not skip a beat and turned around to Belacqua and said, Belacqua, if sitting can make a man wise, then you, my friend, are the wisest in the whole world. Again, it's incredible. So what we have here in this canto then offers us a rather touching personal reunion between two friends. And we see how Dante imports or he carries over the tone of their friendship, one of mutual reproaches into his poetic representation of Bellacqua. We have Bellacqua, the historical figure, and I really want to focus now on Bellacqua, the poetic person, Bellacqua that we find here in the poetry. The dialogue that we've already begun to read together is one that seems to almost have been picked up as if it was, you know, this is the last uh, you know, an encounter that Dante had in the street is now brought into this poetic um, imagery, is brought into the mountain of purgatory because the exchanges that we see here seem to be barred with jibes and sarcastic prods. It is no wonder that Bellacqua is a character that often by commentary has been seen as a caricature. He is a caricature of the sin of laziness, of negligence, which gratefully um, Belacqua had in the last moments of his life recanted. These, um, these sighs, he says, are what won him grace. Um, but what I want to do is, I, like I said, it's no wonder that they, they, they see Belacqua as this sort of caricature, especially due to the brevity of the encounter, especially due to the ironic tone. But what I want to add is I, I think there's a closer, if we take a closer look at the poetry, we might see that the dialogue, although appearing ironic, is actually rather ambiguous and is inviting us as readers to get a little more into the text and to look at the multi-layers of meaning behind the words. If we continue to read Belacqua, now that, he's, now that Dante sees Belacqua, he understands him, he, he recognizes him, he, he's moved by a certain compassion to get closer to him. The slowness of my own move, or of his movements, I'm sorry, his brief words had stirred me to a smile. Um, he had moved to him even closer in the first few lines I had read that even though Dante was tired, he, he moves closer into the shade to be closer to Belacqua. And Dante says, from this time on, Belacqua, I need not grieve for you, right? Because, is, like I said, this is a personal relationship. Maybe when Belacqua died, Dante thought, my goodness, this guy was lazy. How did he make it into heaven? Dante asks him, and again, it carries on this ironic tone, but tell me, why do you sit here? Do you expect a guide, or have you fallen into your old ways? Here, the tone changes. And he, oh brother, what's the use of climbing? God's angel, he who guards the gate, would not let me pass through to meet my punishment. Outside that gate, the skies must circle round as many times as they did when I lived, since I delayed good size until the end. We're, we're, what's being revealed here is the law that regulates purgatory, which is already revealed to us by Manfredi. Those of the excommunicates or those who are, who are negligent have to wait on the shores of purgatory before they can, uh, of anti-purgatory before they can enter for as many years as they had postponed their conversion or their penitence. Line 133, unless before then I am helped by prayer that rises from a heart that lives in grace, what use are other prayers ignored by heaven? And at this moment, Virgil steps in and says, basically, it's time to go, which I'll return to in a second. But let's return to this um, encounter with Belacqua, because I'm not really convinced that it's just uh, a caricature of, of laziness. Virgil steps in and says, Dante, it's time to go. Why would you want to waste your time with uh, a lazy character? It has often been the message of this, of this canto. But if we remember earlier encounters that Dante has with the various souls, um, there's something that betrays Dante as a living individual, the only one to, uh, well, poetically speaking, to, you know, to take this, this journey, the only soul to, the only living individual to, to go to purgatory. What betrays us is his shadow. He still has his body, these other souls, they're disembodied, right? And so there's moments where the souls look and they say, wait a minute, Dante, you're not from around here. You have a shadow. And that will also be a case throughout the rest of, through purgatory, these other encounters where Dante's in some ways betrayed, or his, the fact that he's a living individual is betrayed. But there's, a, there's I think, an interpretive key which might be important for reading or rereading this, this dialogue. And that is that the souls, the lazy souls, are in a shadow. They're resting in the shade. And Belacqua has his head between his legs. And when Dante hears a voice, he moves into the shadow, he moves into the shade, and there he converses with Belacqua. I think it's plausible to think that Belacqua doesn't know that he's speaking with Dante as if Dante were alive, but he's probably conversing with him thinking, in some ways deceived to think that Dante is actually among the souls in purgatory with him, that Dante had died. And I think that's one way of changing the entire tone and the meaning 
of, of this encounter. If we were to read this encounter in the shade of the boulder then, then the rest of the dialogue takes on new meaning. Belacqua's interjection can then be intended not so much to mean perhaps, the opening line, right? Perhaps before you get to the top, you will need to stop and take another rest. But rather, we can read it like this. Perhaps, in Italian it's forse, forse, perhaps before you get to the top, you will need to stop and take another rest. No, it means perhaps before you move up the mountain, you may need to yield to the need to sit like me and wait. Belacqua is not attacking Dante, but simply informing him that these are the rules of purgatory. That perhaps you, Dante, if I think you're a soul like myself, perhaps you are also going to have to yield to the laws, that you too will have to spend some, a couple years, perhaps here, perhaps somewhere else. We can understand Belacqua's forse, his perhaps, to be expressive of his lazy uncertainty, a perhaps which leaves open other possibilities and not not be read with such an invective tone as I had read before. The perhaps can also portray Balacqua as a wise, patient soul, knowledgeable of the divine order that determines the period of time that souls must wait. But also that each soul's case is unique depending upon the number of years of penitence was postponed or perhaps by the prayers muttered on a soul's behalf. So Balacqua again not even turning to Dante, but hearing his voice, says, Dante, perhaps you, like all the other souls, will have to wait. Or perhaps, again, is open to the possibility that Dante's time um, might be determined by his own sin, which, we'll, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, so I think what's going on here is that uh, Bellacqua, again, thinking that Dante perhaps is numbered among the dead, isn't have, doesn't really have so much an invective tone or, or irony or sarcasm to it, but actually might be a voice of wise patience, that Belacqua is someone who was lazy in life, but now on the mountain of, of purgation, his laziness has turned into sort of a divine patience. He has learned a very fundamental element, a very fundamental element that guides the Christian soul, but also guides much of Dante's poetry. And that is any kind of human activity, even ascending the mountain of purgation, will always have to be within the context and the framework of divine providence within the sanctions of God. To go outside of that would be folly. And this would sort of evoke, if we remember from Inferno, some of the imagery from Canto 26 of Ulysses. Ulysses, who's someone who, goaded on by a desire for knowledge, for new experience, goes beyond the limits, beyond the Straits of Gibraltar to try and gain new knowledge, something which he then, in doing so, he eventually ends up on the shores of purgatory or just off the shores of purgatory, and then his ship is sunk by God. Also, if we to go back, I want to I want to review again the moment in which, if you look back at one at line one hundred nine, when Dante points out to um, Virgil this soul, he says, "O sweet Lord, look carefully at one who shows himself more languid than he who would have been were laziness his sister." I just want to point out that the Italian. This look that Dante says to Virgil is adocchia, which rhymes with ginocchia, the knees. He's, he's making a rhyme here between Belacqua's knees, he has his arms around his knees, ginocchia, and he says adocchia, look at the soul who as, looks as though laziness were his sister, which Dante chooses the word serocchia. Serocchia in the Florentine dialect of the 1300s was the normal form of the word sorella or sister. And Dante is rhyming this with adokia, which usually means to see clearly. He's focusing in his attention on the soul, on Belacqua. But I would argue that this sense of adokia is very different from the understanding of seeing in Italian, when you can say vedere, to see, which also implies to understand. I think when Dante turns to focus his attention, he's looking at the external characteristics of a disembodied soul. He's looking at a Belacqua who has his head between his legs, his arms around his knees, and he recognizes that to be expressive, expressive of laziness. But I think just as Belacqua does not see that Dante um, is indeed alive because they're in the whole, they're in the shade, they're in the shadows, I don't think Dante, the pilgrim, also sees truly who Belacqua is. He doesn't understand his words. When Dante smiles, why does he smile? It is yati suoi pigri, his lazy acts and his short words made me smile. It's Dante's focus on the external appearance of the soul 
which in some ways kind of blinds him. He's looking too carefully, but not with that wider perspective, which might allow him to understand what Bloch was trying to say. And that wider perspective, again, is that understanding of the position of the soul in purgatory. This is a soul who is about to undergo purgation. This is not um, a soul who is indeed lazy. Um, that Dante, I mean, Bloch was still carries that um, burden of being, having been lazy, but he is beginning to transform that laziness into a patience, into an understanding that I'm going to have to wait a few more years before the gates of purgatory will, will open for me. So instead of looking at Bloch as a caricature, Dante is playing with two elements, the human and the spiritual, which both form the poetic representation of the character Balacqua, not easily reducible to a caricature of laziness. We can read him as a reminder of the laziness, yes, that all often happen, too often impedes our spiritual life, but his character is a bit more complex. Dante's poetic genius in this particular canto lies in his ability to show us both the human and the spiritual element of the human soul. He takes a friend and brings him and brings into the poetry, he takes his friend with all of his idiosyncrasies, his quick-witted remarks and sharp-tongued jabs, and assumes him into this poetic imagery and renders him a, a soul that is beginning purgation. He is a soul that understands the overall moral structure of purgatory, which Dante needs to understand personally for his own ascent. And that is that for each soul, purification comes at a place and a time according to and assigned by divine providence. Anything otherwise and outside of this plan would be folly. Dante, who constantly has to remind his readers and himself that this is a pilgrimage, is indeed, this pilgrimage is indeed sanctioned by God, has to move up the mountain because the gates of purgatory are waiting to open for him. He's reminding us this because he is afraid of falling into a wild uh, flight, uh, a moment of folly. He has to understand that his own journey has to be within the sanctions, within this time that, Don, that God has set for him. And I see Belacqua not so much as a sarcastic, ironic voice, but, um, sort of goading Dante down, saying, if you're so great, then, then head up the mountain, but is reminding Dante of that very important message, not of laziness, but of patience. That's why, um, as Dante explains to Dante, his, as, as Belacqua explains to Dante his passivity, which is not laziness. And that passivity is an understanding that acti activity not authorized by God is vain and only a sign of one's sinful pride. It is in this sense that I want to go a little further and think that Belacqua might represent for us an anti-Ulysses figure, as I've already mentioned with Counter 26 and Inferno. That is not to say in a negative sense that on one hand you have Ulysses who represents wild folly, and on the other hand you have Belacqua who represents laziness, but the fact that Ulysses is in hell and Balacqua is in purgatory, and that it's anticipated that indeed Balacqua will be purified, is that Balacqua in some ways can actually be a commentary. He can comment on Ulysses and also on Dante's, on Dante's, on Dante's um, travels, his pilgrimage. Um, what I'd like to do right now is have you uh, look at the back sheet of the handouts that I gave here. And there's one thing I want to try out, is going back to Belacqua's final discourse and reading this in light of what we've already said about um, Belacqua, not just as a caricature of laziness, but as someone who understands perfectly well the divine order of things and that going outside of, uh, or human activity that goes outside these bonds becomes one of folly. I want to make a comparison. There's a few things here that seem to echo um, the Canto of Ulysses, um, which I believe was read last year by Professor Hawkins. Um, there's a few things. For example, on, on line 127, when Belacqua speaks to Dante, he says, Oh, brother, what's the use of climbing? Oh, brother, in Italian, is O oh, frate. Frate, brother, is... Um, the word that begins this final speech of Belacqua, and it is a word that will appear throughout the rest of the Commedia. And what Frate does is it lifts the rapport of friendship onto a level of universal love. O oh brother, O oh brother in Christ, right? But the word brother, the last time it had been used in a discourse was in the discourse by Ulysses. And if you look on the left sheet, I've typed out Ulysses' discourse to his crewmen. 
Ulysses is coming back, he's on his way home, but right? he's like, no, we're at the Straits of Gibraltar, let's go a little further, let's go past the Straits of Gibraltar, let's set open course on the waters, let's see what we can find out, let's see what we can learn. His crewmen are old, they have wives and children to go back to, and Dante says, no, let's not be held back by bonds of love and family, let's go forward. He starts that discourse <clears throat> by saying, oh brothers, the sense of oh brother here in Ulysses terms is a word that was that sought to ignore the bonds of love and of familiar responsibility and to go on one last adventure. I think in some ways Dante is trying to purify the word brother here in purgatory. Also, Belaco, when speaking about pure prayers being the only ones that God listens to, which can in some ways speed on the soul, uh, he uses not the Italian word preghiera, preghi, which um, Manfredi uses in Canto 3, but he uses the word orazione. Orazione, sort of like oration, can mean either a speech or can also mean prayer, which the last time that was used was by Ulysses when he describes his riling speech. It was with this small prayer that I spurred on my men along their wild flight. Ulysses' prayer sought to deceive, to place his crew on the wrong course, a course not directed toward home. But it's Belacqua's prayer, which is of a pure heart, well-intentioned, speeds along the soul, not in a wild flight, but speeds it along in a proper ascent up towards God, the love of God. Also, there's a third word, also when Virgil steps in to interrupt Dante, he indicates that the sun is now setting on Morocco. And again, it sort of underlines what I talked about earlier, where Dante's trying to geographically locate purgatory, that Morocco is the midpoint between Zion, between Jerusalem and purgatory. But Morocco is only used twice, again, in the entire work, and it's used right here in Virgil's final words to interrupt Dante, but it was also used by Ulysses when he was talking about Morocco. Morocco is not just a geographical place. It is the place that, again, symbolizes the limits that God sets on our activity. There's a lot more I could say, actually. Um, there's a lot to say about Dante and Virgil as they go off into the next canto, because Virgil will rebuke Dante. He's like, Dante, why did you want to waste so much time talking to these souls? In saying that, Dante will, in canto five, encounter another group of souls who are walking along, mindful, undistracted, chanting the prayer, miserere, when they see Dante's shadow. And they stop and they go, oh, what's this? And they run over to Dante. And Dante expresses that word, um, ran over without break, as sansa freno, without, without breaks. Again, that echoes that tendency, that temptation for folly, for rushing along, for being distracted, which again is how Dante opened up the canto that we're reading tonight about the temptation of being distracted. Um, I think there's a way in which Dante the poet the one writing this, is setting himself apart from what we read here in the poem. He's setting himself apart from Virgil, and he's showing the difference between him, him as the writer and Dante as the pilgrim, because it's too easy to read Bellacqua, again, as a caricature, especially when the, the conversation is so short, because Virgil cuts it off. Virgil himself, who was also cut off by Cato back in Canto too, when they were listening to Castello's beautiful music, they were dispersed, and, Dante, and Virgil was stung by this reproach. And Dante describes that as he was running around, and it's haste which makes all actions undignified. I think those hints reoccurring throughout the entire poem are always pointing at the fact that Belacqua is perhaps a voice at this point in purgatory which we have to listen to more, not one that we should just brush over with haste, that we should stop and meditate, that what is awaiting Dante on his ascent of purgation is going to be one that requires reflection and patience and not allow himself, as he tends off to do, but to rush forward. That Ulysses, it's, it's not a surprise that Ulysses is always understood as an alter ego of Dante. And I think Belacqua is a, a, a close friend, a very important element in this poem, which, although lazy and in the shadows, is very a voice that is close, as it says here, a voice close by, always present to Dante to remind himself of Dante's sin, and that is the sin of pride, the sin of 
of eagerness. One final question. When the gates finally open for Dante, I'm sorry, for Balacqua, when the gates finally open for Balacqua, where is he going to go? Because as we know, the purgatory is set up by um, terraces, and each terrace you purify uh, a certain sin. It might be an easy question. He's going to end up in the fourth terrace. It's where sloth, which arises from defective love, is purified. If you look at number six in the handout that I gave you, Dante is going to ask uh, Virgil about this, this place in Canto um, 17 of Purgatory, lines 82 to 87. Dante will ask Virgil, tell me, my gentle father, this is number, number six, should be next to it. Tell me, my gentle father, what offense is purged within the circle we have reached? Although our feet must stop, your words not, need not. And he to me, precisely here, the love of good that is too tepidly pursued is mended. Here the lazy oar plies harder. This is where Balak was going to end up. But the imagery of the lazy oar plying harder cannot be read without, again, that echo of Ulysses always in the back, always sort of nagging at Dante's psyche. Because if we go back to the same cant of Ulysses, look at number seven of the quotation. Ulysses says, as he describes his, his wild flight, he says, And having turned our stern toward morning, we made wings of our oars and a wild flight, and always gained upon our left-hand side. The oar can either be plied too eagerly, steering off course, or too slowly, which results in negligence and an inattentiveness to others. We know, as well as Belacqua, that he is a soul which will eventually ply his oar harder. But in the meantime, while waiting patiently for those gates to open, he will remain Dante's friend, still witty and sarcastic, but a voice, a reminder nonetheless of the virtue of yielding to the greater law of love. It is this law that compels humanity to desire God and to love each other. It compels, on one hand, the overly active to desist from the pursuit of worldly things from self-love, and on the other hand, it spurs on the lazy, the negligent, to turn their will toward God. In both cases, the heedless pursuit for one's own good and the lazy disinterest for any good at all renders the soul culpably inattentive to the love of the other and blind to the chaotic world around that requires so much attention. Belacqua on the road to purgation is a voice that, as I said, calls out to Dante from close by, that reorders his notion of love, transforms haste into mindful ascension. In conclusion, I see Belacqua as a true pilgrim, a soul that still feels the weight of his sinful laziness, but is beginning that ascension in which he understands that even though he was once lazy, it is now an ascetic, attentive patience, and not zeal, because that will come later, in the fourth terrace, that is needed, a message that Dante always does well to listen to. And with this, I'm going to read it in the Italian, and then hopefully afterward, uh, we can get a chance to talk about it. I'm going to take a drink of water first. By now, most of you figured out that I'm not a native Italian speaker. So, um, it's with great humility that I'm going to try and read this. Quando per dilettanze o ver per doglie, che alcune virtù nostre comprenda, l'anima bene ad esse si raccoglie, par che nulla potenza più intenda, e questo è contra quell'errore che crede, che un'anima sopra altre noi si accenda. E però, quando si ode cosa o vede che tenga forte a sé l'anima volta, vasse nel tempo e l'uomo non se ne vede, che altra potenza è quella che l'ascolta e altra è quella che ha l'anima intera, questa è quasi legata e quella è sciolta. Di ciò è più esperienza vera, udendo quello spirito e ammirando che ben cinquanta gradi salito era lo sole, e io non mi ricordo quando venimo ove quale anima ad una griderò a noi, qui è vostro dimando, maggiore aperta molte volte in pruna, con una forcatella di sue spine, l'uomo della ville quando l'uva in bruna, che non, che non era la cala onde saline, 
lo duca mio e io appresso soli come da noi la schiera di si partine vassi in San Leo e discendessi a noli montassi su un bismantove in cacume con esso i pie ma qui convien con voli dico con le ali snelle e con le piume del grandisio di retro e quel condotto che speranza mi dava face a lume. Noi salavamo per entro il sasso rotto e di ogni lato ne stringea lo stremo e piedi e man volè il suol di sotto poi che noi fumo in sull'oro supremo che dall'alta rippa la scoperta piaggia Maestro mio, dissi io, che via faremo? Ed egli a me, nessun tuo passo caggia Porso al monte dietro a me acquista, finché non appai alcuno scorta saggia. Lo somo era alto che vince la vista, e la cosa superba più assai, che da mezzo quadrante e centro lista. Io era lasso, quando cominciai, oh dolce padre, volgiti e rimir, come io rimango sol se non restai. Figlio mio, disse, infin qui vi ti tira aditandomi un balzo poco in sue, che da quel lato il poggio tutto gira. Sì, mi spronarono le parole sue, che io mi sforzai carpando presso lui, tanto che il cinghio sotto i piedi mi fue. A seder, ci ponemo ivi ambedui, volti e l'avante onde eravamo saliti, che suole riguardar giovari altrui. Gli occhi prima drizzai e bassi liti, poi li alzai, alzai al sole e ammirava che da sinistra ne eravamo feriti. Ben si avvide il poeta che io stava stupido tutto al caro della luce, ove tra noi e Aquilino entrava. Onde egli a me, se Castore e Poluce fossero in compagnia di quello specchio che su e giù del suo lume conduce, tu vedresti il zodiaco rubiecco ancora all'orso più stretto rotare se non uscisse fuori del cammin vecchio. Come ciò sia, se vuoi poter pensare, dentro raccolto immagina Zion con questo monte in sulla terra stare, sì che amen due hanno un solo orizzonte e diversi emisferi onde la strada che mal non seppe careggiar fetton. Vedrai come a costui convien che vada dall'uno quando a colui dall'altro fianco, se lo intelletto tuo ben chiaro vada. Certo, maestro mio, dissi io, un quanco, non vi dio chiaro, sì, come io discerno, là dove mio ingegno pare manco, che il mezzo cerchio del moto superno, che si chiama Equatore in alcuna arte, e che sempre rimane tra il sole e l'inverno, per la ragion che di quinci si parte verso il settentrion, quanto gli ebrei vedevano lui verso la calda parte. Ma se a te piace, volentieri saprei, quanto avemo da andare che il poggio sale, più che salir non posso gli occhi miei? Ed egli a me, questa montagna è tale, che sempre al cominciar di sotto è grave, e quando un più va su, e men fa male, però quando ella ti parà suave, tanto che su andar ti fia leggero, come a secondo giù andar per nave, allora sarai al fin di esso sentiero. Qui vi di riposar la fano aspetta, più non rispondo, e questo so per vero. E come egli ebbe sua parola detta, una voce di presso sonò, forse che di sedere in prie vrai distretta. Al suon di lei ciascun di noi si torse e vedemmo a mancino un gran petrone del qual né io né ei prima si accorse. Là ci traemo e ivi erano persone che si stavano all'ombra dietro il sasso come l'uomo per la neg negligenza a stare si pone. E un di lor che mi sembiava lasso sedeva e abbracciava le ginocchia tenendo il viso giù tra esse e basso. O dolce signor mio, dissi io, addocchia colui che mostra se più negligente che se pigrizio fosse il suo serocchia. Allora si volse a noi e posemente muovendo il viso pur su per la coscia e disse 
Or va tu su che sei valente, conobbi allora chi era e quell'angoscia che mi avacciava un poco ancora la lena, non mi impedì l'andare a lui e poscia, che a lui fu giunto, alzò la testa appena, dicendo, hai ben veduto come il sole, dall'omero sinistro il caro mena, gli ati suoi pigri e le corte parole, mosse le labbra mie un poco riso, poi cominciai, bell'acqua, a me non dole di te o mai, ma dimmi, perché sì succurito sei, attendi tu e scorta, oppur lo modo usato ti ha ripriso, ed egli, offrante, andare in su che porta, che non mi lascerebbe ire a martiri l'angel di Dio che siede in sulla porta, prima convien che tanto il ciel mi agiri di fuor d'essa quanto fece in vita, perché io indugiai il fine i buon sospiri, se orazione in prima non mi aita, che surga su di cuor che in grazia viva, l'altra che val, che in cielo non è udita, e già il poeta innanzi mi saliva e dice, vieni ormai, vedi che tocco, meridian dal sole e alla riva, copre la notte già col pie morocco. I hope so. Your grade depends on a question. <laughs> Ter Terry, he's a, he's a poet from Boston University, all the way from the Midwest. The way that I've tended to start to read Belacqua is that, um, this, is, this is also in some ways going to respond with another question, I guess, is that on one hand, he can certainly be seen as lazy. He is lazy. But Dante's inviting us to read past his gestures, his acts, to the meaning of his word in the context of that boulder, as I saw as a sort of the shadows, a place in which Dante is invited into, and sort of protects him from the sun revealing that he's alive. And so I think there's a certain sense of honesty that, engage, that takes place in that dialogue. But I, he is ironic, he is sarcastic, he is absolutely lazy. And that's the brilliance, the, the genius of what Dante I think is doing is that he's able to bring in a character that is completely lazy, who he knew very well, has all those characteristics that Dante recognizes. You're right, he's a voice that comes out, he looks over and he's the laziest of them all. And Dante remembers that, and he sees that, and he recognizes who he is. And I think that when he asks him, he's like, oh, you're here, I won't worry about you anymore, but, but tell me, why are you, why are you waiting here in, in the shade? Are you waiting in an escort? Or have you fallen in your old ways? I think one way that we can read that is Dante, in some ways, he's looking too closely, this verb, adocchia. He's sort of focused in too much on the soul, not recognizing that, indeed, he will move along. There's no point, there's nowhere else where he can go because to go anywhere else would be outside of the law that regulates purgatory. Ultimately a law of love in that he has to wait and after the, the years that have passed in which he himself in his living days um, suspended or postponed his penitence, and once that is passed the gates will then open. So in a way, it's an, that's why I like him so much because there's a tension because when I read it so many times that's exactly how I saw it. Why go any further? What's the point? Um, and one thing I wish I had time, maybe you've read, I don't know, Samuel Beckett is someone who's taken this character. And he's been, he's been taken in a lot of modern literature. 
sort of as like an anti-hero of the modern times, right? In this modern era, you know, what's, what's the point is a question that comes to mind. But I think we can reread his words that are on one hand ironic, but to go a bit deeper and say that uh, what's the point of going forward is not, you know, I'm not lazy, what's the point of going forward, but there is no point outside of what is dictated by God because otherwise that would be folly. And that's why I think there's a lot of echoes of Ulysses in the back, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know, it's, it's fascinating. I, I, he, even though I, I wanted to push this kind of reading, I, I still go back and I just think, well, you know what, he's just a lazy soul. <laughs> and that's really it, but I'm, I don't know. I think that's a good point, yeah, that in some ways Balakwa, yeah, I think so. I think Balakwa is speaking on behalf of the whole point of, of purgatory, the whole moral apparatus that purgatory exists under, that this is a place for purgation. So everyone you meet there will eventually purify and be numbered among the saints. A sarcastic reading of Balakwa, if you were to say, well, perhaps you're going to have to rest, would assume that Balakwa knows that Dante is on the special trip, right? He's not dead. He's going on this pilgrimage. He's going on ahead. And so sarcastic, um, the way that I read it first, if it were sarcastic or ironic, is that he's saying, Dante, if you think you're so great, then go on up. Continue all the way up to God as you will go. Um, but I think it's the other one. I think he's, I think there's a more honest engagement because in, in, in cantos before and the ones that follow, there's these encounters between Dante and other souls that know that he's still alive, and they say, go back home, when you go back home, talk, you know, go to my hometown, talk to my family, tell them that I'm here, have them pray for me, but Belacqua doesn't ask for that, because he doesn't know, he doesn't know that Dante is, is alive, and so in some ways, I think his, his, his speech is a bit more honest to what purgatory is telling, what purgatory should be telling Dante, and that is, you need to focus on your own purgation, which he does eventually. I mean, this is the beginning of purgatory. Isaiah? <laughs> Sorry, I'll go back. What kind of laziness would be on perdition, if not the kind of lack of laziness? Would merit perdition? Yeah. Well, How he's. Lazy as lazy as? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I think. I think um, you know, reading this canto, it, it brings you back to Inferno, Canto 3, because there's an Ante Inferno, which are some of the first souls that Dante encounters. He hears these wailing sounds, and he turns and he says, Master, who are these souls that are waiting outside the gates of hell? And he said that these are the souls that have lived in such a way that they gained neither fame nor blame, and that they're in the company of the legion of angels that when Lucifer rebelled against God, right? Now, that, now talk about going outside of the order. Lucifer's like, you know, why can't I be like you, God? And God's like, no one else can, obviously. That all those angels were cast down to, to hell, but they are the angels that neither supported, nor, neither took God's side, or neither took the side of Lucifer. They were unable to make that kind of decision. And so, Belaka would have ended up in hell, I think, if it wasn't for these final prayers of his life. We can't forget that Dante hated Pope Boniface VIII and that you have this whole thing going on with indulgences, right? If you have a departed soul, you pay some money and there's indulgences. But here Dante also has all these souls who have horrible lives, lazy lives, meaningless lives, or lives where they were you know, completely ignorant of Christ or, or, or in some ways evil, excommunicated. Um, but just that one sigh, just a sigh, to say that, hmm, yeah, I guess I'm lazy, and I do, I do love you, God, okay, and he gets in. So I think there's that dynamic to it as, as well, yeah? Uh, I was going to say, what you were saying uh, the last minute, repentance uh, saves him from hell. Also, um, the sheep you gave out, uh, the Uh, 
Mm -hmm. And this causes the negligence that is a mortal sin. So I guess unrepenting, uh, the first uh, lack of fervor would uh, unrepenting and to purgatory anyhow, uh, and the mortal sin unrepenting would put him in uh, the inferno. I think you're, yeah. I think you're right there as well. You know, there's, yeah, the a lack of fervor and charity is sort of like saying, I was going to be nice, but I didn't do it. I mean, you can sort of remedy that, perhaps. Um, but I think there's something deeper you know, to, the, to the second one, a lack of charity itself, or even a kind of negligence that even internally you, you are indecisive. That needs to be overcome because that understanding of indecisiveness has to be understood in the context of to what does the soul tend? And this again is the beginning of the canto of where Dante is talking about the soul that can be distracted. The, the purpose of the soul is to return to God, to be focused on God. So if the soul is internally so negligent and indecisive, it's not going anywhere. It's not going in the proper direction. So I, yeah, no, that's a good point. So that in the, in the back? The yeah, the uh, uh, one lines, one thirty three and one thirty four. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You have Dante being somewhat sarcastic. You know, are you expecting a guy? Or, or really genuinely concerned, like Belacqua. You're in purgatory and you're still lazy? Yeah, go on, yeah. Well, it's just, it's just like that phrase, are, are you waiting for a guy? Is that why you, I mean, I read that as a sarcastic thing. Uh, but then maybe what is happening in your reading is Belacqua saying, no, I'm really waiting for a prayer. That's true. And maybe Dante doesn't recognize that. In other words, instead of being so damn sarcastic, I could be helped by a friend. And, sure yeah. And, <laughs> you know what, I'm, I don't know, but I'm curious, why didn't Dante say something? There was, there was a sort of silence in Dante's smile when he recognized his Belacqua. He doesn't say. Don't worry, I got you covered, or I'll certainly go back like other souls ask him to do. A cert I wonder if there's a way, I, I don't know, it's something I'm so curious about why Dante is silent in this moment and doesn't reveal any more. And perhaps he would have, but Virgil interrupts him. Because Virgil, I don't think he gets the point either. He's, he'd rather spend time talking to the exciting souls as opposed to the negligent souls. But no, that's a good point. Yeah, the, yeah that's the only guide you really do need, again, are the prayers that are ordered, that are pure, and, and not the prayers that Ulysses was using on his brothers to say, let's, let's go forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the difference is, I mean, we've just got out of hell, and, and uh, the way that I've always, I think what happens is I've read Balakra as if I were still in hell, that I'm, we we're so used to encountering these souls that are static, that are frozen, that are unable to understand or see, they're, they're fundamentally disordered. Um, but I think Dante, again, he, he sees the outer expression, he sees laziness, uh, the fact that, you know, he's, the way he's sitting. Um, and doesn't listen to Belacqua's words. Um, yeah, you're right, and that story I was mentioning earlier is certainly apocryphal. I mean, who knows if Belacqua actually quoted Aristotle and said it's man by sitting becomes wise. I mean, there's a way in which Belacqua, I mean, he was a musician, he made instruments, he played music, but was also lazy. I mean, and music is certainly requires a lot of 
an excitement of the intellectual mind. Um, but maybe, maybe that sarcastic joke there could also be read in a new way, this, when, when Bellacqua says, Dante, it is by sitting and being quiet that one does indeed become wise. And Dante says, well, then no one's wiser than you, and moves along. Dante, who was a politician, who was exiled, who is now writing this amazing poem in which he claims to be the only person among the living who went up to see God and came back to tell the story. I mean, that's why Dante constantly has to remind himself and the readers that this has to be sanctioned by God, otherwise it's folly. Um, and that's why, yeah, I think you, I agree with you that Bellacqua, I think, is that voice of, voice of contemplation. Not a perfect voice of contemplation, but one nonetheless. Very human, I guess. It's somehow the misdirection and the awkwardness that, that allows us to think more or allows the space to imagine the transformation that is taking place. The fact that there is no um, dramatic narrative. You're right, yeah. Under the whole, conce the whole conceit of the shadow, that there's something more honest to it. Because like, in, like I said in Canto Five, when, uh, I don't want to comment too much on it, it's for next month, but you know, when Dante moves ahead and he encounters those souls who were undergoing that transformation, they were praying, they were in unison, they were walking, and then they see Dante, his shadow, and then they run over and he uses these hyperboles. He's like, you know, never have I seen the, the sun rays disperse the fog or or vapor in August rising from, rising from the earth as these two souls ran to me without break, San Sefreno. That they're, and throughout that entire canto, Dante doesn't seem to be really engaging these souls. He's encountering them, but he's not in a real dialogue that's as really human and personal as one with Belacqua. Because we're, we're, we're back with two friends that are really talking, and Belacqua has something to say that's really honest. But it doesn't quite work. It doesn't quite work. Dante doesn't get it a lot, but he will. I, no, yeah, I think you're really. I think you're right. I, I enjoyed. I, at first, I was like, "This is a very boring canto. It's not very dramatic." I was looking forward to, but I think in that non-drama, something else comes out of it. So. Mm -hmm. That's a good question because you know, that's a really good question because a lot of the souls in Canto One are singing scripture and all the other souls are usually engaged in prayer, but these are just lying in the shade. It seems that maybe they aren't really doing anything to ooh, that's a good one. And she's one of my students and she got me. No, <laughs> no, that's a really good one. I don't know. I I'd turn that to anyone else if they have a comment on that one. I mean is that That's, that's, yeah. And I think in Dante's words, there is that knowledge. He's not just, his words, he's like, what's the point of going on? I have to wait, I think, is not just what's the point of going, but wait for those, those prayers. So again, I think the prayers is really important for this understanding that the, the prayers are um, what wins that favor. It's that, um, it's the way in which the soul is engaged in an activity toward God as opposed to an activity that's just an active you know, mentality which can distract us from God and distract us from other people. So, no, but it is a good, it is a good point. I mean, it's good because it, it shows the difference between these souls that are, they're waiting, but they're not, it doesn't seem quite evident that they're engaged in prayer. You say, yeah? Oh, yeah. Hmm? Hold on, hold on. I'm sorry, huh? Average flow 
That's a good one. Yeah, it certainly is reprehensible still. Bakwa is, I mean, he did sin. He's there because of, of that. And so um, I think it, you could look at it that way as, as well. That it's, it's still comment, it comments on that tension. It comments on, um, you know, this is indeed a sin laziness. On the other hand, you need to be certainly more active. Um, but that's something you would know better than I, yeah, about the political, exact political situation and, and what he wanted of Florence, because he wanted to return. He wanted, he, he certainly had an idea about how political activity should be. And so, uh, but I want to... I didn't, I didn't hear what um, was said, but isn't it per definition that in purgatory, yet you can do nothing for yourself? You get 300 years in purgatory. You just sit there. That's the rules. That's you get, that's you get. And the, the, the idea that he's lazy, he doesn't do anything, he doesn't pray, that's, that's just not how it works. Mm -hmm. But I think this rule is more specific to ante purgatory. Ante purgatory, you're still outside the gates. And the rule is then 300 years, 1,000 years, how many ever years? Right. Or how many years, if, it's three, if, uh, if you were excommunicated, it's three times as many years you're excommunicated. Yeah. Or as many years as you were lazy. But once those gates are opened, then we see a, a very dynamic activity in the part of the soul to purge themselves, to purgate. So there is, but no, you, you pointed out a good, diff a very important thing. Sometimes I forgot to say ante purgatory as opposed to purgatory. I was just going to say that these souls are still thinking of uh, purgatory as a place of punishment rather than of purgation and a place that will lead them to salvation. He says the angel at the gate, he says he's just lying back because the angel at the gate will not let me pass through to meet my punishment. It's not really a punishment. That, I mean, if you can look beyond the punishment, uh, in other words, he doesn't say he won't let me go to my salvation. Hmm. He says, well, let me go to my punishment. Well, I think, I think because if you were to say salvation yeah. and he would be doing what Dante did was asking oh, how much further do I have to go your mind should certainly be ordered on attaining salvation but Bill Aqua is that really great voice that comes from purgatory saying no this is a place where you're going to have to purify yourself it's going to be tough and it is going to I mean it is a punishment in some ways the Italian word is uh, martiri I think it might be connected to martyrdom but in a way in which you're suffering you're suffering for a purpose you're suffering right. for that passion but he doesn't see the purpose you don't see the purpose of the suffering because I think once we get into purgatory, I may be wrong that the uh, souls are then willingly, willingly undergo their punishment because they can see what lies ahead. Okay. And he. At this stage, he can't do it yet. Probably not, yeah. And he will eventually, but I think, yeah. That's they are point. knowledgeable, though. They are knowledgeable of the time that they have to sit and wait. Yeah. And they have just to just sit and wait. Just There's boring, no as boring, boring as hell. Look, but you can <laughs> shit all the <laughs> 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 It's not just <laughs> If you came tonight, then you'll, you'll be fine. <laughs> no, and when they sold these indulgences, yep. they sold you the time off. How much time money off. you have? Mm. Time off. 500 years? <laughs> Nevertheless, I think that martyrdom is distinct from, say, castigo, or because it always has when you, it always has um, a sense. It, it has a sense of witnessing God. Yeah. So it's, a pun, it's a punishment. It has a design. Yeah, they're exactly. They're like, mm -hmm. yeah, but the punishment consists in not yet seeing God. That's right. right. But there is still the promise in the word punishment. Yeah. Okay, but it's not in the English word punishment. No. Yeah, I think that's the. That's what's true. That's why the translation is always <laughs> going to take you a couple steps away from. Yeah. Here you have a, something a little different. Uh, 
The souls on the boat going to Inferno? Yeah. You know, the ore, the imagery of the ore comes up again there. Yeah. You have the ore that would be plied harder in Canto 17, in which the fervor will finally be rekindled for souls that never had they kindled in the first place. And then you have the wild, crazy ores of folly. And what, um, uh, Carrion, right? That's his name? Yes. Carrion, that's how I'm pronouncing it. Carrion, he's, uh, he's actually with the ore. He's actually striking the souls who are trying to reach or get off or reach out. He's, it's the ore that's being, no, I'm knocking you back in. This is where you're going. And so I think the imagery of the ore. It's also divine will. You're moving according to divine will, I think. They have no choice. They have no choice. Even the even the the no choice. Even, even if they try to get out. I mean, that, that's divine will. Divine will is moving. Divine will dictates that they're going to wait for 500 years. Divine will will then be what they will begin to love in and purgatory to and, and to accept. Or in hell they're going to. Because it is also God's love and divine will that also in some ways is what establishes it creates and sustains it until, uh, yeah. So that's a good question. I, did I see another hand? That was, yes, hi. Totally different subject. But it's about Virgil being in purgatory. Now, Virgil's never been in purgatory before, right? Mm -hmm. So how is it that he can say to Dante in line 96, and I say no more, and this I know is true, and he describes how the mountain gets easier as you go up. That's a good point, yeah. <laughs> You're right, Virgil's not necessarily been there before. He is lost. lost. He says, we'll have to wait for another escort, even they couldn't find the path without him. Virgil does know some stuff, though. I mean, they're talking... I don't know, it's a good, it's a good question. I do not, I honestly don't have an exact explanation. Maybe others can certainly, or Dante scholars can help me out. I wonder if... Um, the way I originally, my first reaction to it was that he, they are having... Um, conversation of, of equals about uh, about the geographical location, something that Virgil would certainly know about, I guess. Um, and he described, he, yeah, he is describing to, to Virgil how it will be. I mean, in some ways he knows what his mission is. I mean, he knows, even though he's never been there, and he's in a certain point, as um, someone who took our course on, on Dante said, he's going to have to go back down the mountain, right? Um, it's just brilliant. And, uh, See, he knows what he has to do, and he seems to be kind of speeding that along, even though he himself is not fully aware. That's why I, I see that Virgil as there's moments where he, I think he was sort of wrong or hasteful uh, to take Dante away from, from Bellacqua, and he was also hurt when he himself got wrapped up listening to music, and so he knows that it's his responsibility. As he's trying to say, like, look, Dante, it will be easier for you, because this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to bring you through your purgation to that wiser escort. It's Beatrice, it's Beatrice. And then he'll go down. He knows that for certain. He knows that. Yeah. So I, uh, just to go back a few, a few pages, uh, we never really hear the dialogue between Virgil and Beatrice when she drops down to ask him to come and be in Dante's guy. It could be that at that point he's made aware of what his journey is going to be and what he will encounter. And he may know that he has to move along with the Dario, even though, even though Belaco says, hang around for a while. Um, there is, a, there is a, a time frame that he has to respect, I'm sure. Yeah. It's on you for Dante. It's on you for him as well, right. But he knows that there's going to be, there's a case. Yeah. Well, it's a little after nine already. I want to go on some limits. Thank you. Thank you.